at maybe a darker side of our soul yoga series, and I titled it uh, The Soul Blues. Let me ask you, if you don't know somebody that is dealing with depression, put up your hand. If you don't know anybody, put up your hand. One. So the inverse is, we all know somebody who's dealing with the dark soul blues. Pastor Dave opened the door when he started two Sundays ago when he said, the dramatic rise in depression in our society over one generation. It is something that affects every age group, every ethnic group, every gender group. Depression, the soul blues. So why don't we talk about it? Have you ever heard a sermon on depression or suicide? Yet if it's so prevalent that all of us know somebody that is dealing with it, why don't we talk about it? Why is the church so silent? The irony is the Bible is not silent about it. The Bible has no problem. It's a mature rated book opening up people's lives and dealing with every aspect of what they struggle with, their crises. It starts with Adam and Eve. It starts with Cain and Abel and discord in the family and brokenness and blaming one another and killing. It starts with Abraham and Sarah not having children and that struggle for 25 years with God. And then we get to the greatest prophet in the Bible, Elijah. And those that go to the Thursday morning Bible study will know what his name means. El, meaning God, God that was called in the southern kingdom of the two tribes, El Elohim, and Yah, Elijah, Yahweh, God's name in the northern kingdom. And in the name of Elijah, my God is Yahweh, is the two names of God, the united 12 tribes. His name is a confession. I mean, who could give their baby a better name back then than my God, Elohim, is Yahweh. In His name is the secret revelation or revelation when God comes to Moses in the burning bush and He says, Who are you? And God says, Yahweh, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. I do not change. God's name is a verb. And so Elijah, the greatest prophet, benefits not only from his name, but through the mighty things that God does in his life. He lives in the northern kingdom what was later known as Samaria. And there's a king, Ahab, and his wife Jezebel, who is a Canaanite, who worships the god of Baal, or Baal, the fertility god, with his cohort Asherah, who gives children and rain and crops and fertility and fruitfulness. And this Jezebel has all the priests, the prophets of God killed, until Elijah's the last one standing. And Elijah is the one who's able to go to the widow of Nain and resurrect her son. He is the one to do the miraculous multiplication of the oil and the flour so that the widow doesn't starve. He's the one who can do resurrections and miracles. He's the one who comes and he calls 800 priests of Baal together, gets them on Mount Carmel and says, I challenge you to a deal, your God versus my God. An entire day they pray and they worship their God and they slash their bodies and they pray that Baal would come and consume their sacrifice. And then Elijah goes and he does the same. But he takes buckets of water and he pours it over the bull and the water and the firewood until there's a moat around it. And then he prays and his God shows up mightily, consuming the stones and the rocks and the wood and the bull and everything with it, even lapping up the water. And he has the 800 priests of Baal killed. 
I mean he is at the highlight of his life. He's given the best sermon ever preached. His God shows up. And it takes one sentence, one statement to do everything, undo everything in his life. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like this life of one of them by this time tomorrow. She says, I will have your head, just like you had the head of all my priests. And so what's Elijah's reaction? He was afraid. This is the guy who has just defeated all the Baal prophets. This is the guy who had said, I will close up the doors of heaven and for three years it will not rain a single drop. There will not even be dew. And the entire country suffered because of the lack of faith of Ahab and Jezebel. And then he prayed and God sent the rain and finally a drought is broken. And yet one single sentence, I will have your head, and he runs scared. He was so afraid, he got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. Now anybody who's gone to Israel will know there's the expression from Dan to Beersheba. From the smallest tribe way in the north to Beersheba, which is the most southernmost town where you get the peninsula of the Sinai. He flees from literally the one end of the country to the exact opposite end to get away from this woman. Cowering in fear over someone who says, I'll have your life. He throws all his principles, all his faith, everything that God's ever done in his life, throws it away. He left his servant there, but he himself went another day's journey into the wilderness of the Sinai and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. And he asked, he might die. It is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree, and he fell asleep. And suddenly an angel, God, appears and touches him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and he lay down again. The angel of the Lord had to come a second time to him, touch him again, and again say, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too long, too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, which in other places is called Mount Sinai, where Moses received the law, to the mountain of God. At that place he came to a cave, and spent the night there. If any psychiatrist or psychologist reads this story, what is the automatic conclusion they will have about Elijah? Say it. What are the clues that he's depressed? He keeps sleeping, keeps laying down, He's lethargic. He has no energy. What other clues are there? Say again. Not He's not eating. He has no appetite. He wants to die, cat. He says, take me now. I have no will to live. Take me now. I want to die. All the classic symptoms of depression. Why don't we talk about this if it's in the Bible? Why don't we talk about that people don't suffer just from depression in the 21st century. It is part of the human condition. Some of the Psalms have been written by people in deep, deep depression. And it happened to me a year ago. These thoughts about suicide have been with me for many years. And as a professional, I'm like, why did you not see it? Why did you not give attention to it? That these thoughts are not normal. 
that I should have sought help so many years ago. The thoughts of, you know, you get in a difficult situation, just end it. Just make it easier for your wife and kids. Just end your life, because that's what my mother did. But I know the pain of it doesn't take the problem away. It took five minutes with a psychiatrist last year to say, you have major depression. You have depression that comes from your family lineage. And I can tell you that through good therapy and good medication and changing psychiatrists and getting better medication, that after a year it is so much better. So much better dealing with the soul blues, the depression, the darkness, the suicidal thoughts. I was at Michael's house in December the last time that I had depression or suicidal thoughts. It's amazing how the veil, the cloud of lackluster, wanting to die, not feeling connected, how it can flip. Now, being on a right medication after three, four, five weeks changes your entire life around. And let me tell pastors out there who are debunking medical care and good therapy, you are robbing people from their lives if you think God cannot use good therapy and good medication. It's part of how God solves stuff. What did God say through the angel? Eat! Drink. But God's not done. Just like I cannot BS my therapist. Because that's what we do, don't we? You tell the psychiatrist one thing, you tell the same story to the therapist and to the new therapist and the new psychiatrist, and you have the same story, and I'm sticking by it because it's my story. <laughs> but they see through the nonsense, and they call you on it. And God does the same with Elijah. So the question is, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Because where is he supposed to be? A few hundred miles up north, dealing with Jezebel, dealing with the issues that have given him this depression. And he's fled it. And then he goes into his woeful excuse. Well, uh, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Isn't that what it feels like to have depression? To be, I'm the only one, and nobody can solve my problem, and it's too big for me to handle. That's why I'm fleeing. That's why I'm saying, take my life. I don't want to live anymore. And so God has to act. God has to show Elijah, and somebody said it to me, and I said, I will repeat it in this service. At this point, Elijah has been doing things for other people, miracles and healings and resurrections, and showing how good his God is. But he never claimed it for himself. He didn't believe that God was there for him. He was always just giving to others. So God shows up. God says, go outside and look and wait for me to appear. Now, remember that when God appeared to Moses with the tablets of the law, Moses was the only one that saw God. And it says very clearly, and Moses saw God from the backside. Because if he saw God in God's full splendor, he would die. And he came down the mountain, his entire face was beaming, and they had to put a cloth around him because he was uh, waking them up at night with this halo shining. And so the only other person that sees the very presence of God is Elijah. And Davis preached on it. It's not in the earthquake. It's not in the rumble. It's not in the wind. It's not in the mountain shaking. It's in the what? Up there. The sheer silence. God's not in the mightiness or in the extravagant or in the powerful, God appears to Elijah in the silence. 
That's the worst thing for someone with depression because we have so many noises, so many things pulling and tugging at us that we feel like we're drowning with all the noises. So what does God do? Make it silent. Because when you're silent, you can truly hear and see. Is it good enough for him? And then he goes, wraps his face in a mantle, and goes stands outside of the entrance of the cave. Even God appearing to him does not move him into action. And so a second time has, God has to come and to say to him, what are you doing here? Why are you not moving? Why are you not getting going? Why are you not on your way back? And what does he do a second time? Spin the same story. Different psychiatrist, different God, same story. And God will not tolerate his nonsense. I alone am the only one and I'm struggling through this crisis. And God says, okay, if that's true, then let's get you help. Then let's go. Go and return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Damascus is way up north, just to the east. Go to Damascus, anoint Hazel as king over Aram, of the Arameans. And go and anoint Yehu as the new king of Israel. And because you don't have a helper, you're all alone and you've left your helper behind, it seems he's no good. Go find a new helper. Go anoint Elisha. My God saves. Go find a new helper. And in the end, he gives the mantle to Elisha, who takes over his role as prophet. But that's not all. Yet, I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You think you're all alone? You think you're the only one going through this crisis? You think you're the only one that is depressed because you are the only one left? I have news for you. There's 7,000 like you who have not bowed. Go back. Go find support. Go get a helper, a therapist, someone to talk to. Go find the community of the 7,000. The sermon today is about me. Because in this past year, I had to find the 7,000 from people in this church and people who have become close friends. The 7,000 that have been there to support me through this darkest time of my life. The 7,000 who know what it is and who know how to be good friends. In 22 years, it's the time that I've become the sheep and others have become the shepherd. And the roles are reversed. And I want to thank those. Every time that I want to lay under the broom bush and just fall asleep and not eat and feel I'm all alone, there's a text. There's a phone call. There's a let's have coffee, let's have lunch, let's go play golf, wink, wink. Let's get together. Sometimes God's servants get depression and get the soul blues and deal with the same stuff that you deal with every day. I pray that as you support me, I can turn around and support you in the days and the hours and the years ahead that when you go through things, that Dave and I are there for you. Thank you for your support. As I said at eight, I'm at a point where I need your help. Amen. God, there are parents sitting right here who have lost children to suicide. There are parents and adults and youth who know what it is to deal with depression and bipolar and schizophrenia. We have good friends that are struggling to hold on to life, who are giving up. Help us to be a good friend. 
to be like the angel, to insist, eat, drink, get your energy, get out of this extremely negative place. Get into community, get into fellowship, find the 7,000, find the Elijah, find the helper. And so thank you for Susan Dutra and for Ivan Tether from My Friend's Place. For the countless teenagers and young adults on our streets who come here bright-eyed, full of hope, and who end up homeless, selling their bodies, discarded by their families and community and society, and for MFS, and for the way they pick up the pieces of these people's precious lives and bring them to wholeness. Come now and speak through Susan. Amen.